so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode contains discussions of self-harm and suicide. If this is triggering for you, give this one a miss. And if you need to speak to someone, reach out to Lifeline on 13 11 14. It's the 21st of February 2021, a summer's day on the south coast of New South Wales. A small group of campers are walking along Bonda Beach, an incredible expanse of pristine sand and clear blue water surrounded by National Park. Along the shore, washed up, they spot a single grey Asics shoe. It is only when they look more closely that they realise inside it holds human remains. The group, who are visiting for a surfing trip, are alarmed. Quickly, they contact the police. It wasn't long before the police were able to identify who the DNA belonged to. It's Melissa Caddick, who had disappeared three months prior from her Dover Heights home, some 438 kilometres from the South Coast Beach. What the discovery didn't answer was what exactly happened to Caddick. Did she take her own life? Was she murdered by her enemies? Or is it possible that the foot was not evidence she was dead at all? Could Melissa Caddick, a woman accused of stealing more than $30 million, still be alive? I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with journalist and Seven News presenter Michael Usher, who's been covering the Melissa Caddick case for the past year. In October, he sat down with Melissa's husband, Anthony, for an exclusive one-on-one interview about her mysterious disappearance. When was the last sign of Melissa Caddick, according to her family? Just before dawn, on the morning that she disappeared, which was November 12. Now, the last sign, it wasn't a visual sighting, but there was a sound of the front door, which her teenage son heard and told the investigators that he'd heard the door open. It was a routine for Melissa, we understand, that she went for either a walk or a jog around about that time. And that sound is about the last sign of Melissa Caddick at all that morning. Now, her husband, Anthony, didn't see her get up. He didn't see her leave the house. No one physically saw her leave, but that's the last sign that they heard. Did she take anything additional with her or was it just the basics you would take out if you were going for a walk or a jog? Just the basics and that's the strange thing. So keeping in mind that day before, which I would imagine was probably the most traumatic day of her life, having had the ASIC investigators been in the house for some 14 odd hours, a lot of disruption, a lot of accusations. But that morning she walks out of the house and it's significant for what she didn't take and that was set of keys. Wallet, phone, none of them at all. Now, this is a woman who always said she was on the go, always doing business, uh, always in contact. And that morning after that amount of scrutiny, the house being raided, she doesn't take anything, particularly the mobile phone. And that's the interesting point. Anthony finds, once they do a bit of looking around, the mobile phone plugged into a charger. Uh, She had a big walk-in wardrobe at their house and it was weird not even like on a a table or anywhere significant it was sort of down in amongst some shoes and some boxes the mobile phone was plugged in there but apparently that was a convenient point where she used to charge it every now and then Mm. but it was there so she didn't want to be contacted nor did she want to contact anyone else it would seem so that was strange she just literally just walked out with her with her uh, you know leisure gear on her walking gear on and that was it can you tell us a little bit about the day before. Obviously, there was the raid. What exactly were they looking for? It appeared as if they were there with the intent of seizing assets. They had a very good idea of what was in the house. Now, that wasn't provided by Melissa nor her husband, Anthony. 
they had some information. They had an insider of some kind, it would appear, who was able to say, here's what's in the house. So twofold, they certainly went down to her office area. So the raid begins in the early hours, around about dawn again that morning. That group of people are the ASIC investigators, the security investigators, the financial regulators, and a couple of federal police officers, AFP officers, as Anthony describes them, the muscle. And all they did was make sure that he stayed away from certain areas and made sure that they stayed in separate rooms. So in Melissa's office were the ASIC investigators and her. Now, in that office, they bundled up a lot of files. She worked from home. That was one of the things I didn't know about all this. Malibu Investments, her business, worked from home. So it was a, not a big office area, but they took a lot of files. They took her hard drives, but they seized assets. They knew that there was a big safe down there. This is in the lower level of the house where her office is. They took out in the order of about $2 million worth of jewellery, probably more. They went to her walk-in wardrobe. They seized dozens of her shoes, and these are all high-end, mm. very big-name designer labels worth thousands, a lot of handbags, and some of them were worth many, many thousands of dollars. They took art off the walls. So they were getting their hands on as many items of value as they could find. Did they ask a lot of questions about what was going on? That bit we're all trying to work out more because Anthony, her husband, was put in a different room. He heard the warrant being read, and that was certainly to investigate her broadly. There was some detail in it, but broadly for fraud. But what the ASIC investigators asked Melissa in her office, we don't know. We've seen the vision, but the audio is muted. And we haven't yet because that's still relatively an open investigation. They're waiting for the liquidator and the coroner to do all their business. That hasn't been released, may never be released. We'll certainly request it. But we don't know the specific questions they asked. But it was all along the lines of investigating her for fraud. So twofold, they seized the hard drives, they seized paperwork, they seized whatever office material they thought was of value. But it was also high-end material assets of value that they seized as well. Those material assets give us a bit of an indication as to the sort of lifestyle that Melissa Caddick was leading. I've read that she was going on holidays to Aspen. She was living in this incredible house. Did family and friends just think that, you know, she was incredibly successful in her endeavours? Absolutely. She was high-flying. She was happy to pose for photos in financial magazines, uh, you know, be sort of named and lauded as a successful investor. She almost treated her investment group as a small club, and there was some angst from some people who couldn't get into it, believe it or not. There were some falling outs, apparently, of, oh, no, I've got a select group of clients. I'm not taking any more at the moment. It was a really interesting game she made around it all. Like, I want to be in because the word went around that Melissa's investments were returning crazy, crazy rates in all sorts of market cycles. You know, she was getting really good returns. So everyone around her just thought that she was extremely successful. And because many of her investors were friends and or close contacts, she treated it like, how do you put it, like a personal club. They were friends as well. And word of mouth was only that she was doing well. Had they received proper statements, had they received not doctored or fraudulent paperwork, they would have realised that the money was just disappearing and all for personal expenses for Melissa and her lifestyle. So no, the impression of Melissa was only one of success. Big house, flash cars, holidays annually to Aspen and other parts of the world, unbelievable jewellery. You should turn up to society events, you know, quite bejeweled and some quite extraordinary pieces. The best gowns, the best designer shoes. It was only one enormous picture of success. What was her background in, in terms of investing and how did she rise up through the ranks to even have those connections and kind of garner the trust of friends and family to invest their money? She'd worked in some banks and she'd worked in some financial institutions in junior levels. And then she went out on her own in the early, around 2011, 2012, to set up this thing called Malava, which was her private investment vehicle for clients. And then very quickly just established herself, as everyone thought, to be a hotshot personal investment advisor. Her scheme seemed to be not short term, nothing that could be questioned fast or that she had to deliver on, but lots of long term. So people handed over their savings and superannuation, the sort of thing where she could then advise, leave it with me. Like any good investment cycle, you've got to leave this for five to 10 years, you know, and then we'll see where it's all at. Don't worry about the market highs and lows. It's only ever measured over 10 years. So, that gave her enough time to shuffle and do what she was doing in what was essentially a Ponzi scheme. Every now and then, people came along and said, actually, I need some money back. And there are some stories of the 
We believe there are 72 investors. That figure changes a bit, but that's the best handle we can get on it of varying scales. But every now and then she had to pay out. But like any good Ponzi scheme, she'd got new investors in, had a bit of cash on hand. So if she had to pay out along the way, there were a couple. And see, that word got around as well. Oh, no, I was able to get my money out and it was fine. So for a couple of years, it all looked legitimate and it was fine. The truth of it is, and what ASIC have given to me in statements is, they can't even find evidence of investments. Anthony, her husband, said she was downstairs in the office, in his words, because he said he just doesn't know anything about this and didn't know what she was up to. But the screen would have lots of red and green on it. And, you know, she kept the computers open to look like she was day trading or share trading or following investments closely, clearly graphs and charts and whatever. But as far as the security investigators are concerned, ASIC, they can't find evidence of investments. The money was coming in. And it was going straight out toward her lifestyle, which is quite extraordinary. There's not even a pretense it would appear. Now, this could be proven wrong because they're still investigating, but there's not even a pretense of a large share portfolio that perhaps the liquidator could even, I don't know, pull apart now or keep trading to try and get people some money back from that sense. So, I mean, I put it to Anthony in the interview I did with him. I mean, she was essentially downstairs playing office playing financial investor. It was all a front and a fake and a fraud. She was <laughs> downstairs just on the computer. Gosh knows what she was doing when people weren't looking. But she certainly wasn't investing in established schemes that could be found. Anthony was her second husband. Do we know much about her first husband and what she was doing when she was married to him and how that sort of fell apart? No, and we were a bit discreet to not go into too much detail there. He made it very clear in some of the approaches we made that he was a private person that had divorced Melissa. They had a child together, that he didn't have a lot to do with the raising of the child. The son lived with Anthony and Melissa. Anthony, for all intents and purposes, was stepdad and very active, and he made it very, very clear that he didn't want to be involved. He was a lawyer. I understand to some point they might have lived overseas for a while, perhaps in the UK or London. And there was some common bond in financial services and all legal circles, and that's how they met. That it wasn't a long marriage, didn't last, and that Melissa had, you know, almost sole custody of the son that they shared together. And even in the process of this, when we interviewed, he didn't want to be a part of anything. And so does Anthony maintain even now that he knew nothing about Melissa's dealings? Mm-hmm. Yep. Said he knew absolutely nothing. I challenged him in many, many times on, on camera and off camera in the, in the long dealings I've had with him. And still, I have to him that I don't quite believe it. He's very, very adamant, though, that the nature of their relationship was one in which she did all of that. To the best of his knowledge, he only ever saw happy clients. They used to organise a lot of social functions, like I said, like a club. It was all very close. And he only ever saw, in his words, Melissa doing great things for people. (laughs) How wrong he was. And he had no knowledge. He said he's just not good at those things. He had his own job. He earned a, a pretty decent income as a celebrity hairstylist to a point. Mm. Certainly uh, many women in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, big fans of his and actually remain big fans of his. I've had quite a few reach out saying he's good. He's really good at what he does. Mm. And we spoke to Joe Bailey as well. He said, no, he's one of my best. So Anthony had his own income, his own wage. He said he worked hard for years. Melissa worked hard. And every now and then they enjoyed it by going off to Aspen, even down to fine things I challenged him on. But you know, what about day-to-day monthly expenses, annual expenses on the house? He said, no, he would give Melissa some money even things like to cover the lease on his quite expensive Audi R8, which for anyone knows is probably one of the more expensive cars you can buy in Australia, a real high-end supercar. But he said even the payments for that, he would give Melissa some money and it was, you know, lease arrangements or whatever were handled by her. And he just didn't have a clue at all about the day-to-day dealings that she had and certainly had no idea that she was running a Ponzi scheme and defrauding people. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with Seven News presenter Michael Usher about the disappearance of Melissa Caddick. So Melissa goes missing on that morning. She goes out and she doesn't come back. How long until her family report her missing to authorities? Well, It was probably Anthony more directly, her husband, and this is the curious part of the whole story, about 30 hours. Mm. And that leads to a whole lot of questions, like why wait 30 hours? Challenged Anthony on it. His version of the story is that she was in shock and deeply distressed from the raid on the house the day before and that because she always handled affairs, 
he presumed that she was off doing that and or needed time to try and digest it all. She had an appointment, which was meant to be 11 o'clock the day she went missing to go and I guess what would have ended up being facing charges of some kind to meet with the ASIC investigators as well. Now, he believed that she'd gone off, she'd done her exercise and that somehow then she had connected with lawyers and or whatever else she needed to do to try and sort out the mess. So he waited some time. Anthony acts as like house husband too. So he had to get their son to school in the morning, pick him up in the afternoon, lunches, whatever else, and, and just sort of run the house and get all that stuff going. I, I got the impression that in many ways, even though Anthony paints a picture of this really loving marriage of two people desperately in love, there were quite independent parts of their life in many ways. So he just dismissed it all. Eventually, Melissa's brother contacts Anthony or vice versa. That bit's a little clear. Anyway, it's the brother, Adam, who says, you've got to ring the police, mate. Like, this is too long now. So Anthony does eventually ring the police and he explains and he also got hold of the Australian Federal Police contact from the day before. Some details were left and he then alerts them. But it's 30 hours that passed. So there's some questions that get raised in all of that. I put them to him. Did you wait that long to give her a head start? Did you wait that long so that she could get affairs in order if there was hidden money or hidden whatever so that she could, I don't know, concoct some story, use her resources? She was clearly resourceful in some manner or other to rip people off. She's had some nunt somewhere. Did you give her a head start? He adamantly denies it. Since the New South Wales police, the federal police, they've all dismissed that as well. There's certainly no record of Melissa making any contact with anyone at any stage during that day. Keeping in mind, like we said at the beginning, her mobile phone was left at home, all sorts of things. So the 30-hour gap remains still Mm. a strange one. I think people listening to this would go, hang on, if my partner went missing for even a couple of hours against any sort of normal routine, I'd be pretty worried and not wait 30 hours. So that part remains a bit strange. But there are many strange parts of this story, so (laughs) that's just one of them. And it wasn't just a normal routine. It was, as you say, one of the most traumatic days of her life. And then she disappears. What would Melissa Caddick, for people who don't quite understand fraud and the charges against her, what would she have been facing for a crime of that magnitude? A string of very serious fraud charges. And, you know, the amounts we're talking about are $20 million plus over a couple of years and probably not so much the amount as the number of people that were affected. The true number is about 72 investors over the course of eight to 10 years. Serious jail time, serious consequences. You know, ASIC has a checkered history of actually prosecuting these cases all the way. But given what we've learned since, that it was fairly black and white from what we can see. There was no elaborate offshore schemes. There didn't seem to be bank accounts in strange parts of the world that we couldn't touch offshore. There was just money she was taking. It's a good old-fashioned Ponzi scheme. You know, you get new Mm. investors in and you do that constant cycle of bringing new investors in. You spend the money and or you have to pay out every now and then, but you're always bringing someone in to top up all of the funds. So she would have faced some serious jail time and serious penalties. She would have been able to get a lawyer, I guess, and fight all the way and got it whittled down perhaps to some degree, but it was going to be a real hard one to try and explain given it was so black and white. In terms of theories, I would imagine that the police would be worried in those, you know, first few days that Melissa Caddick, her mental health might have been in Mm. question. But were there other suspects? Was it considered that perhaps someone that she had taken money from would have wanted to hurt her? Yep. You had a lot of money involved. You had a lot of lies. Given that she'd clearly led a very deceitful life for many, many years and resourceful in the way she did it and to keep it hidden. Where was she funding money from as well? Were there some pretty dark and shadowy characters involved in all of this? And in Anthony's line, as he has often said, her husband, you know, when money's involved at this level and if these allegations are true, anything was possible. There was one speculation that she'd been seen down at the Rose Bay Marina boarding a boat that morning. Was she taken out to sea, you know, threatened, told to be quiet, or did they just dump her out at the sea? This crazy theory, did she cut off her own foot hop around somewhere and get offshore to try and prove that she jumped off the cliff. I think sooner or later we'll find the coroner will just rule that's entirely not the case at all and the body came to pieces when she most likely jumped from the cliffs of the eastern suburbs there and went out to sea. Did she go out the front door and someone pick her up, get straight into a vehicle and go from there? Had she contacted someone the night before? Now, there's no phone record on her phones at least to say that that happened. There's just nothing. She makes contact with no one after the police raid. 
and all of Anthony's texts go unanswered until he finally realises the phone's actually in the house on charge in the cupboard. What didn't help here and what led to more of the mystery is Anthony and Melissa had a pretty sophisticated security camera system in their house, a good eight or ten cameras, high quality, high definition in all sorts of angles, and a couple of the cameras on the front door and gate had a really good view. Like you could have seen her walk out the front door extremely clearly, picked up a facial expression, got some sort of gauge of the mood that she was in and worked out, did she turn left, right, go across the road, get into someone's car? If she did walk down the road either direction, you would have seen her for a good 100, 200 metres. It might have given you an idea. Mm. When ASIC did the raid, though, they took all the hard drives and part of that is they took the hard drive to the cameras in the house. So the cameras were active but no recording was possible. So... It led to more of the mystery that she just vanished the minute the front door closed, which for all purposes she did. Had that recording device still been there, you would have got a sense of her state of mind. Was she acting fast? Did she get into a vehicle? Did she just walk off? Did she go for the walk and go straight for the cliffs and take her own life? So that just added to some of the intrigue, the fact that those cameras weren't connected to any recording device because of the raid the day before. It was February 2021 when that foot washed up on a beach and they were able to identify it as Melissa Caddick. Some say that that is an evidence that she's died, that it could be a decoy. There are lots of theories. What do you think is the most compelling theory? Do you think, as you say, that it just happens to be the only part that we've found? Yeah, look, I went to the beach where the foot was washed up down on the south coast. It surprised me because I thought it was more of a popular beach than where it was found. It was two backpackers who came across the shoe and they looked in the shoe. They saw that there was, in fact, the remains of a foot in there. Kind of looked like a mummy, believe it or not, in the way it appeared. Could other parts of her body have actually washed up in the same current and been on that beach? Yes, 100%. And just over time, given it's such a remote beach and a couple of surfers go down there every now and then, you know, in good weather, it's a very long stretch of beach. There's all sorts of driftwood and bits and pieces from a distance. You wouldn't necessarily pick anything up. It was an absolute chance discovery that even the foot turned up to try and give some clues. Might other parts of her been washed up on that beach and they've been, I don't know, scattered to four corners, you know, birds pick them up, everything else, other wildlife that come onto the beach. That's entirely possible. The current, we spoke to an expert in, in ocean movements from New Zealand who, again, by chance, had only just the previous summer put a whole lot of buoys and motion detectors in the ocean off the cliffs there at Dover Heights and were really accurately able to read where the ocean currents went on the day that she almost certainly probably jumped in. And it's correct that her foot would have washed up in that part of that beach on the far south coast. So might have other parts of her also washed up in that area. Yes, might the foot have been, you know, severed by, you know, other sort of sea life eating what was her corpse, which is a horrible thing to say, and just the foot was dismembered and washed up down there. That's also possible. The ocean holds all the secrets on this one. It really does. Mm. And it's highly unlikely that they will find more of her, or if it does, it'll be a bone here or there. But the foot is, as best we understand, is enough for the coroner to conclude enough about cause of death. And that is due soon. The coroner court's backed up, so they've taken a while to do it. But it will conclude how exactly the foot was dismembered from the body. It will almost certainly rule out that it was cut off and that she is you know, somewhere in the world missing a foot, which mm. just sounds cra- sounds crazy. But he, look, even the New South Wales police took many days to try and rule that one out as well, even after the foot was discovered. They couldn't conclusively say, and they're still waiting for the coroner to rule on that as well. But it certainly led to all sorts of mystery. There would have been a far greater mystery had that foot not turned up, and I still think it's remarkable that a couple of backpackers on a really remote beach where no one goes almost all the time found the shoe and the foot and, <laughs> and were able to match it. It's quite amazing. Finally... You spoke to Anthony, obviously, about what he thinks happened. What's his theory? What does he think happened to Melissa? Anthony is still in a confused place where he wants to believe that she met with foul play, that there were people who wanted her dead. He still goes down a murder theory. I think as a little more time goes on and more time I spent with him shooting our one-hour documentary, he became a bit more practical and pragmatic about the whole scenario and probably believes that in such a devastated emotional state, which he says she was, she's probably taken her own life. But he's still hanging on to the theory that harm came her way because of the amount of money involved and people wanted her silenced for some reason and he believes that murder shouldn't be ruled out. Now, 
he's welcome to that theory. I, I'm more practical. I know some of the police I've spoken to said, look, the game was up. She had no exit plan. She was somewhere between a narcissist and a sociopath in being able to carry off the amount of lies she did for the time that she did. She was never going to face the music. She didn't know how to explain herself. The guilt, the shame, the everything else, and having to account that she was a thief, a common thief on a large scale, would have been far too much for her to handle because she was all about front and appearance. And and the curious part out of all of this, and this is the one part I have said to Anthony many times, is I just don't quite buy his version of the story. And he accepts that, is that the night before, after a 14-hour raid in the house, he stays up a little longer. Melissa goes to bed. He jumps into bed. They spoon. They hug. They say goodnight, darling, to each other, effectively. He goes to sleep, she wakes up and disappears, and that's it. I still find it hard to believe that they didn't talk about a thing. And I've put to him many times, don't you say, what the hell just happened in the house? What happened? Are these allegations true? Do I need to worry? Are we okay? Or you know, There's a million questions you'd be asking. But just to go to bed and not say a thing, look, it may well be the truth. I mean, they, they had a unique relationship. They loved each other. They loved, 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 loved each other. And he did never want to think anything bad of her. He may well have just accepted that and gone to sleep. He did go to bed sometime well after her many hours. He doesn't sleep very well. He stays up on his computers writing music and you know doing all sorts of things that he enjoys doing. But the fact that they didn't talk about what would have been a life-shifting raid on their house and they just go to bed, love you, darling, she wakes up and disappears, is a bit of the jigsaw that doesn't make sense to me. But mm. he believes that, that harm still could have come her way and he'd prefer police investigate further. However... He said, if that's what the coroner rules, I will accept what everyone says. As you could expect, he just struggles with all of it. And he he still cares for the majority of the time for her son as his stepdad. He gets him to school. He does all those sorts of things. And, you know, he's a teenage kid who's, if you take everything else away from the story, there's a teenage kid who's lost his mum this year, has been in the news nonstop, and all sorts of terrible things have been said. And he's got to deal with that and still get through school and hold down friendships. And Anthony sort of has taken it upon himself, regardless of what else is going on, he knows that they're going to be kicked out of the house. He knows that that's all going to be sold. Anthony said, I will do anything to make sure whatever money's around to go back to the investors. He's not trying to hang on to the things. He's not getting in the way of the liquidators. Mm. He's just trying to care for the son. But hanging on to a deep love for Melissa and struggling to understand that she was this person that we now know her to be, one of the greatest con women, con people Australia's ever seen, and was able to get away with it for many, many years. And he's left behind struggling with all sorts of accusations and questions and, you know, I spent a lot of time with him and also trying to keep a young teenage boy on the straight and narrow and get him to school and do everything else. It's a really sad amount of wreckage that he's dealing with. And I've said to him a few times, and I meant it, I wasn't trying to be mean, I posed the question to him, I wonder whether he is in fact the biggest victim of Melissa's, that she chose him deliberately because Mm. she knew that he was never going to ask hard questions about what she was up to downstairs in the office. And he never did. He just accepted her. He loved her. He fixed her hair beautifully. He loved the bit of the good life. He also claimed, you know, he worked hard and had an income and they were trying to build for the future and everything but a loving husband. I mean, he wouldn't be the first partner in a relationship, male or female, to not really ask a lot of questions about what your more successful partner's up to and what's in the account or not. So I see him as one of her victims. He struggles with that a bit, but I really do. Michael Usher is widely regarded as one of Australia's foremost investigative journalists. He's an award-winning reporter, foreign correspondent and newsreader with a career spanning almost three decades. If you want to hear more from him, you can watch him on 7 News Sydney and the latest 7 News. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and is produced by Gia Moylan. You'll hear more true crime stories from me in February, but from next week, Emma Gillespie will be taking you through a four-part series on the Killer Queens of Sydney. She'll be diving into the entwined history of Kate Lee and Tilly Devine and the Razor Gangs who waged war in inner Sydney in the 1920s and 30s. Make sure you tune in for that.